good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Pio D'Emilia, and I'm seeing today this uh, very timely press conference at the Foreign Correspondent Club of Japan regarding uh, the issue of uh, residents' uh, re-entry in Japan, I mean, the, the ban for foreigners uh, to re-enter uh, Japan once they leave. As you all know, this is an issue that has been uh, hanging around uh, for many months now. Uh, individuals, businessmen, all foreigners involved, uh, uh, including tourists, of course, but especially residents, are very much concerned about this issue. Some countries have decided uh, eventually to react, like uh, Germany, who has announced that uh, until Japan uh, releases uh, some uh, of these uh, restrictions, Japanese uh, uh, citizens won't be able to enter Germany. Other countries are considering uh, equal reciprocal reaction, but still, today, if any foreign resident in Japan, regardless of his uh, permanent visa status, long-term visa status, or working visa, cannot re-enter Japan unless uh, he provides enough documentation to use the so-called uh, uh, humanitarian clause. Uh, on the news, a uh, uh, couple of days ago, there was uh, a young uh, French lady that uh, asked to go to the funeral of his father, but uh, he, she was refused the re-entry, even in that case. So we are really at the stage uh, that uh, it's very hard to understand uh, the position of the Japanese government. Uh, Foreign Minister Motegi yesterday gave uh, a very controversial press conference uh, reiterating uh, the Japanese position. And today we have uh, two important guests. The president, uh, the chairman of the European Business Council of Japan, Michel Mrozek, I'm sorry, yeah, right, okay. <laughs> uh, that has already come once uh, here at the club. And uh, Christopher Lafleur, who is the chairman of the American Chamber of Commerce in Japan. Uh, of course, they speak on behalf uh, of the uh, business community, and uh, without uh, any more ado, I will give the uh, microphone to uh, Michel first. Uh, please, uh, um, uh, let's uh, hear from him, then we give uh, uh, questions to the floor, and also you can ask questions uh, by sending uh, uh, email uh, at, uh, the, um, at the foreign correspondent club. I don't see the, maybe, can you, is it possible to put it uh, on the screen, the email? I don't see it here. Anyway, please go. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much for inviting uh, me again, actually, to, to speak on, uh, on this, uh, as you said, important uh, matter and I'm even more honored to, to be here, uh, although virtually with uh, Chris Lafleur, uh, the chairman of the American Chamber of Commerce. Uh, this is also uh, showing that uh, the situation here is uh, of concern for uh, the American business community but also for the European business community in the same way. What I would like to do uh, since last time that I have been here was exactly one month ago, I think on June uh, 22nd, I would like to give you an update uh, relating some, uh, some issues uh, from our side, from the side of the European uh, business community. I would like to talk first about a survey that the EBC has conducted with the great help of the uh, national European Chambers of Commerce, in particular the German Chamber of Commerce. You may remember last time I have shared with you uh, the findings of the German Chamber of Commerce. And uh, then I would like to uh, address a couple of uh, examples of um, Europeans, European leaders or European companies 
uh, in which way they are impacted by the uh, strict travel ban as imposed by Japan. Finally, also I would like to express uh, uh, some legal concerns uh, regarding this, uh, this strict uh, measures. So, starting uh, with the survey, and I, I, I was advised that I have only 10 minutes to talk. Um, starting with the survey from June 30th to June 12th, uh, the European Business Council has uh, reached out to Euro European and Japanese companies based here in Japan, uh, if I say to Japanese companies, that means Japanese companies dealing also with uh, trade with Euro. And uh, we had 376 uh, respondents, and the findings were quite interesting. So, I will give you three figures. 85%, 85% of the respondents were directly impacted by the travel ban. So, being positive, we can still say 15% were not. 44% um, of the companies uh, that we, uh, the providers with, with, with answers, had suffered some financial, um, some financial uh, losses uh, with respect to their travel ban. And finally, 23% of the respondents uh, are expecting from the Japanese government some sort of uh, remuneration, be it in form for uh, tax relaxation or direct uh, compensation uh, relating to the losses suffered by the travel ban. So this is, these are the results uh, of, the, of the survey. This is not something that I made up, or this is not something that, that the, the EBC has, has suggested to the, to the respondents. Uh, to give you a, a better uh, understanding of the companies that have answered uh, the survey, uh, we had uh, the most companies were coming or were based, headquartered in, in Austria, France and Germany, Austria 81 companies, France 80 companies, Germany 109 companies. 19% um, of the companies are large companies, are companies with over 1,000 uh, employees. Uh, 56% are small to mid-sized companies with employees between 1 and 100. Uh, as for the industry sectors, 30% coming from trade, 38% coming from services, and importantly, 22% coming from manufacturing. Then, uh, I said before, 85% were directly impacted by the, or burdened by the travel ban. Uh, of this 85%, excuse me, of the 100%, 30% were moderately uh, burdened, 40% heavily, and 15 very, very heavily burdened. So, that's, uh, that's an overview about the survey. You will find the survey if you want to see some more details on the, on the website of the, of the EBC. Uh, in view of the time concerns, I would like to go to the, to the next issue and address a couple of examples that, that have uh, raised also the EBC's uh, concerns. Uh, we have companies that have work to perform in Japan that are waiting for um, expertised workers coming from Europe and they are not coming, they are not allowed to come and uh, the projects that are related to that are basically on hold and can, cannot be, uh, cannot progress, cannot be developed. We have uh, cases where the top leadership is basically excluded from coming back to Japan, companies that do not have the leadership here because of the uh, circumstances. Um, Japan, uh, excuse me, European engineers cannot visit Japan uh, to inspect projects in order to be part of tender offers made by Japanese. Finally, we have also companies very much concerned uh, regarding the limited competition with their Japanese counterparts. We have companies saying, we. Uh, as foreigners, we cannot travel abroad, whereas uh, 
companies in the same sector can travel abroad, visit their customers, visit their business partners, and do uh, and perform better than we can. We are losing market shares. And uh, finally, so to stay in the time frame, we have been also approached by a couple of European companies expressing concerns uh, regarding not being able to handle their investments in uh, Japan. And as a lawyer, I have looked into some treaties. Of course, uh, the Swiss-Japan Free Trade Agreement is closest to my heart, and it has, uh, as opposed to the EU-Japan EPA, uh, investment protection chapter, and um, looking at the provisions, I, I, I see that uh, the foreign companies may have a good point, and I'm very concerned, we are concerned at the EBC, that um, this, this situation may also trigger some investment disputes against Japan. So far, Japan has never been on the respondent side uh, in investment dispute, according to my knowledge. That's a, a short update from the European side now. I think I'll pass the word to, to Chris. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Michael. And uh, let me now introduce uh, uh, the president of the <coughs> American Chamber of Commerce in Japan. Welcome uh, to FCCJ, even if uh, from remote. And uh, please, go ahead. Well, thank you very much. Well, I want to, uh, excuse me, express appreciation for this opportunity to talk to the members of the foreign press community here in Japan. Excuse me. To address this very important issue. Um, I think it's important to start off uh, by uh, expressing uh, some recognition of the situation with respect to the pandemic here in Japan um, and appreciation for what the Japanese government has been able to accomplish um, in terms of checking the spread of the infection so far. I think all of us in Japan uh, owe uh, the Japanese government, uh, its authorities, its healthcare workers, uh, a tremendous uh, debt of appreciation for what uh, they've been able to accomplish. Uh, because compared to uh, the countries uh, that uh, our businesses are largely headquartered in, uh, Japan has been uniquely successful so far uh, in containing the virus. Um, and as we discuss with um, our Japanese uh, friends and colleagues uh, what might be done uh, to uh, further improve the situation uh, in Japan, we all need to continue to be mindful uh, that uh, first and foremost, the health and safety uh, of everyone involved uh, is uh, the most important objective here. Uh, with respect to travel, uh, we at the ACCJ uh, have been very concerned about uh, the way Japan has implemented its policy on several levels. Uh, as I think most of you will be aware, uh, those uh, who have been living and working in Japan um, up until um, April 2nd were able to depart Japan uh, with the possibility of being able to return. But those who've remained uh, since April 2nd have been unable to do that. Um, and so that poses um, a, a serious uh, impediment for many of our members uh, and their families uh, uh, for their lives in Japan uh, and certainly uh, for their conduct of business in Japan. Uh, and this is a policy that is applied uh, only to foreign residents of Japan. So a Japanese national person in principle uh, is free to depart Japan uh, and return to Japan following, of course, the uh, standard uh, quarantining and testing protocols. Uh, and in the case of the United States, for example, uh, a Japanese uh, person could, in principle, again, uh, fly to the United States um, and then return uh, without issue. And that is not um, a, an opportunity that is currently afforded to long-term foreign residents of Japan 
Um, and uh, from our uh, reading of the literature and understanding of the science, uh, there really is no uh, science base, or scientific basis uh, for that policy. Um, and so our first request to the Japanese government has been uh, that uh, the policy be revised to uh, permit uh, foreign residents, long-term residents, who are here on long-term visas to do uh, business or study or what have you, uh, to be able to travel uh, in the same way that a Japanese national is able uh, to travel. Uh, now, we appreciate that Japanese government uh, uh, policy uh, involves uh, extensive testing uh, on arrival, um, and we understand that one of the key constraints that the Japanese government is working with is the number of tests that they're able to perform at ports of entry. Um, and uh, again, uh, since safety is the foremost concern for everyone, I think, in this situation, uh, we need to be able to work uh, within the constraints that Japan uh, has. Nevertheless, uh, if there are numbers uh, constraints, then uh, surely uh, some way could be found uh, to apportion numbers in such a way uh, that uh, foreign residents of Japan will also be able to travel. Now, going beyond uh, those who are resident uh, currently in Japan, uh, there's the broader issue, uh, which Michael uh, has been discussing extensively from the European perspective, uh, on uh, business travel to and from Japan. Uh, and in that area, of course, uh, we're looking at some very difficult decisions we understand the Japanese government faces. Uh, for uh, those in Europe, uh, the, uh, the, where they find themselves at this point uh, in the waves of the pandemic uh, is somewhat different uh, from uh, where the United States is at this point. Um, and so again, we, uh, we appreciate the need for care and caution as Japan, as Japan looks at this. Nevertheless, it's clear that uh, the current restrictions are going, are currently having and will have increasing impact on Japan's effort uh, to further uh, grow its economy and overcome uh, the tremendous shock that the pandemic has created economically for Japan. Uh, and so business people uh, from uh, global companies who are unable to travel overseas uh, to work with colleagues to attend meetings uh, are increasingly going to have difficulty running their businesses here. Uh, we have a number of members who are, are currently unable to return to, to Japan to run their businesses uh, because they've been caught outside the country. Uh, we have other cases in which executives are due to depart uh, and their replacements uh, cannot be brought into the country. Uh, in other cases, we have technical personnel who ought to be uh, in-country to ensure that uh, our businesses can operate uh, as effectively uh, as possible. Uh, those sorts of uh, technical personnel cannot be brought into the country. Uh, so in a variety of areas, uh, this uh, travel situation is going to impose increasing costs on the Japanese economy. So we think it's important that uh, we, uh, the foreign business community, and uh, the Japanese government uh, and business community be working together uh, to address uh, what is going to become, as I said, an increasingly serious issue uh, for the Japanese economy. Now, we understand the Japanese government is looking at ways it can uh, restart business travel with certain countries where uh, they believe the uh, virus is under reasonable control. Uh, we've all seen reports about some of those countries. Um, and our request to the Japanese government in this respect uh, is that uh, as travel for business reasons becomes possible under Japanese policy uh, with other countries, uh, that that opportunity uh, be accorded uh, equally uh, to the foreign uh, business community going both ways. Uh, that's going to be important uh, for many of us, particularly those who are, are part of organizations that have regional bases uh, in other parts of Asia. Uh, you can see that becoming an issue uh, very soon as Japan begins to reopen with other countries in the region. Uh, and as uh, those uh, travel bans are eased uh, with other countries in the future, uh, we think it's going to be important that the foreign business community be able to help Japan maintain its global connections, its global business posture by participating fully in those programs. So let me uh, uh, end my remarks there, and I look forward to responding to any questions. <clears throat> Thank you uh, very much, uh, Christopher. Um, I already have uh, a 
question from uh, a member in remote, Ilgin uh, Jurmans uh, from BBC World Service, Turkish, uh, which connects very well to what you just uh, said. Uh, probably the best uh, solution, the, the one that we all uh, hope for, is that Japan, as other countries, uh, uh, produces a system by which uh, you arrive uh, at the airport, you have your test, you wait for the results and then you proceed uh, whether for quarantine or just a fiduciary isolation. Uh, and yesterday, Minister, Health Minister Kato Katsunobu hinted at the fact that in view of uh, you know, a, a, a easing of the rules, Japan is going to uh, arrange for 10,000 tests. Uh, 10,000 tests. Uh, but it will take until September, he said. Um, providing that until now, I believe, we have a capacity of around 2,500 a day. Do you think this is a credible uh, mm, a credible possibility? You think that uh, Japan is really able to produce a capacity of 10,000 tests and that this will uh, lead to an easing of these uh, uh, procedures? I, can, I think it's for both of you. Michael first or Christopher? <coughs> um, so I, I understand that uh, this is this is possible. Uh, Ten thousand tests. Probably we have been reading about uh, enlarging the capacity uh, of testing uh, at the airports here in Japan. I would I would I would not question uh, this this measure. I think that uh, the Japanese government could go even farther. It could go farther by uh, cooperating more with with uh, in the, for us relevant or for for me relevant European uh, governments and uh, take advantage possibly uh, of the fact that some of the European countries have already testing uh, uh, cap uh, capacities at the airports. Yes. So I think uh, uh, connecting to that... Like Korea. Like, yeah. like Korea, like Korea North, I, I'm also aware of Germany having uh, testing capacities on, on, uh, on the major uh, airports. So there, there are measures. We can increase the capacity of, of testing uh, by cooperating with, with other countries, I believe, and make sure that people arriving in Japan are basically uh, uh, negative. Christopher? Yes, I agree with that. We've certainly seen in other countries that uh, testing uh, in the, uh, the high thousands, uh, if not more, on a daily basis is possible in many of our countries. Uh, and I think Japan uh, could also avail itself of perhaps a broader range of technologies, uh, perhaps including from foreign com companies uh, that uh, are available on the market. Now, uh, you know, the question is, of course, availability uh, and the ability of uh, Japanese uh, labs on site to uh, to process those in real time, etc. Uh, there are obviously some logistical questions that would need to be resolved, uh, but clearly other countries have been able to do it. Uh, so uh, we would expect that Japan uh, would have the capacity to do that, and we hope they will uh, in short order. Okay, <clears throat> let's uh, now open the floor, uh, Richard. Thank you. Richard Lloyd Parry of The Times. Uh, a, a couple of questions. One is, do you have a sense of the comparative picture worldwide on policies like this? Uh, I mean, we've been told that the United States, uh, Japanese can come and go in a way that foreigners here can't. Uh, but, but I know, for example, that my colleague in Moscow is in the same position as me. If he leaves Russia, he can't go back in. I mean, overall, you know, among the large, rich, advanced democracies, how much of an outlier is Japan on this? Or are there other governments that are taking a similar position? That was the first question. The second was, um, I, I don't know if you can answer this, but do you have a clear sense of the motivation for this political decision? Uh, I mean, do you take it at face value that this is simply a decision made by the government purely in the interest of public health, or are there, as there sometimes are, uh, hidden political urges behind this? 
Um, I suppose one more point is what's the whole name behind, behind this, this matter? And a third question, if I may, um, which is what, what can foreign correspondents do to, to help with this pressure on the Japanese government? Uh, I mean, there are many of us, including me, who are regional correspondents, and we can't do our jobs either if we can't travel outside Japan. It's harder to measure that in financial terms, but it does make a difference. And there are various uh, organizations, committees of journalists, the FCCJ, and associated with it. Um, and we've talked a little about this and what we might do. Most of the work we do is connected with freedom of the press and, and access. And this isn't really, doesn't fall obviously under that rubric, but what, if anything, could we do to help? I want to take it. Yeah. All right. So, uh, yeah, I, I can't speak on behalf of, of all the countries. I can, uh, but I, I'll be happy to limit myself to, to Europe. So, uh, Europe has uh, opened up as of as of first of uh, of July, uh, as far as I know. So, basically, travelers from Japan can travel to to Europe. Uh, there is one exception, which is, which is Germany, uh, requesting uh, from uh, from some of the countries. There are 15 countries to which uh, Europe has opened. Um, Germany is requesting reciprocity from, from three of those countries, uh, as far as I know. Uh, so we have, uh, this is the situation in Europe, I cannot, uh, I, I'm not aware about every single uh, other country uh, in, uh, in the world, uh, but I'm, I'm here to speak on behalf of, of Europe. To go to the second question, what is, what is the real uh, thing behind? That's, that's what we are all asking ourselves, I believe, what is what is the real reason? And uh, just uh, to, to to share uh, you, with you my thoughts is, uh, you know, I had a lunch just uh, two days ago with uh, with a friend, uh, Japanese, who who was born in, in Switzerland, and uh, he grew up in Switzerland, working for for a large Japanese uh, company here in Japan, and basically he can go to Switzerland whatever he wants. He can go to Switzerland whenever he wants. He can travel to other countries. Uh, now, um, I have, uh, I have, uh, I have uh, a Japanese wife. I have uh, two kids with Japanese citizenship, and uh, my kids are, are asking about that too. They are saying, like, so, so, Papa, why are you uh, treated in a different way than, than the Japanese? I, I don't know what to say to them. I don't know what to say to them. Uh, we are living here. Uh, we are we are working here. We are paying taxes here. We are we are uh, enjoying the system. We are enjoying life in Japan. But what's the true reason behind it? I, I do not know. And uh, something that, that caught my attention is uh, is, is the um, confident, international covenant on the on the civil rights that uh, basically says in Article 12, Paragraph 4, it says no one. No one shall arbitrarily uh, be deprived of the right to enter his own country. And uh, this, this caught my attention and I, 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 I put some more effort to, to that. The interpretation of that, according to the Committee of Human Rights, is that uh, the, the own country is not only limited to the country of nationality. Exactly. It goes much farther than that. And I can, I can, uh, I can quote from the, from, the, from the comments of the Committee of the Human Rights Committee. It says the wording of Article 12, Paragraph 4, does not distinguish between nationals and aliens. Thus, the persons entitled to exercise uh, this right can be identified only by interpreting the meaning of the phrase his own country. The scope of his own country is broader than the concept of country of his nationality. So this is, this is, this is clear in this regard. In this and sense, Japan is your own country. In this sense, I would call Japan uh, my own country. And this is how my kids see me too. They say, Papa, this is your own country. Well, if I may add, that even in the Japanese constitution, it's clearly written that foreigners with regular you know, uh, <coughs> permit of uh, staying are totally prepared uh, to the national. The only thing that we cannot vote. But for the rest, any other discrimination is uh, legal, in my opinion. Anyway, uh, Christopher, do you want to add up something? Well, with respect to the U.S., um, permanent residents of the United States, under my understanding, 
uh, with the exception of a, a few places uh, designated the world, uh, such as certain parts of China, uh, are free to, uh, to return uh, to travel back and forth uh, to and from the United States. Uh, and therefore, uh, in that sense, uh, a Japanese national who held that status would be able uh, to travel back and forth to the United States. Now, the situation has gotten a little more complicated, as I understand it, because uh, President Trump has uh, decided to uh, restrict uh, the, uh, the travel uh, to the United States uh, of uh, certain uh, business visa holders. Uh, and so I'm afraid that uh, it would depend on the particular case. Uh, but uh, in general, uh, relative to the United States, uh, Japan clearly uh, imposes uh, a higher level of restriction uh, on travel by foreign nationals uh, than, again, in principle, the United States does. Uh, with respect to the motivations for this, um, I think all I can add is that uh, there really doesn't appear to be a scientific basis uh, for this policy. Um, and uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, there does seem to be some concern about Japan's ability to manage numbers. Uh, but in that respect, with, a, uh, with some fairly uh, modest uh, changes to the way the system is being implemented, surely foreign nationals uh, could be treated the same way as Japanese with respect to, uh, to travel. Uh, and we certainly hope uh, those modifications can be made quickly. Thank you. I think the, the third question was addressed to you. What can the foreign correspondent love to? No, no, he's not here. <laughs> <obviously. laughs> he knows very well what is my opinion. On that. Well, I mean, I, I ask it because yes. uh, it, it seems clear that between you, you've done a certain amount of lobbying, um, and, and that there is an effort in train by organisations like yours. Uh, perhaps the answer is no, not really. But the question is, what, if anything, could organizations of foreign correspondents or individuals do to support that? The Foreign Correspondents Club has, has done a lot and, and, and uh, we as a European Business Council appreciate, uh, appreciate the, the efforts. Um, we, we have the impression that uh, the foreign media has, has been discussing this issue uh, extensively. We, we, see, we see that foreign media uh, do, uh, we, we read about this uh, issue almost every day. Um, we don't think that the Japanese media uh, writes enough about this. So, answering this question, maybe I'll be very happy to see more um, Japanese media in the room. <clears throat> so, I'm sorry, could I just to be clear on, on the question of Europe, is it the case that a Japanese resident of Europe, with all the papers of working visa, paying their taxes and so on, could leave anywhere in Europe and return freely. Can leave uh, anywhere in Europe and even to Japan and return freely, yes. To their residence in Europe. To, to, yes. That's right. That's right. So basically, uh, uh, Europe is treating uh, the residents of Europe in the same way as it's treating uh, their nationals. Not distinguishing uh, between the nationality and residence. <clears throat> Just to clarify, uh, when Europe decided this on July 1st, uh, they still left to the single governments the possibility of enlarging or restricting further these procedures. For example, Italy imposes a quarantine of 14 days. It's the only country in Europe that imposes to the Japanese 14 days. But that is left to the single governments, <clears throat> even now. Okay, and the... Andy Sharp from the Nikkei Asian Review. Just a short question to both of you. First of all, Mikhail, you say you've been lobbying the Ministry of Foreign Affairs here in Japan. Could you give us details of their response to your lobbying? And the same question to Christopher. What kind of lobbying have you made to the Foreign Ministry here, and what have they said back to you? Thank you. Thank you, Andy. I'm, I'm, uh... My answer will be very, very short. Actually, I'm, I'm afraid I, I am not supposed to share the, the, the information uh, about that uh, meeting uh, to, regarding the travel ban. Uh, I'm very sorry for that. Christopher? 
in Venezuela. Um, we haven't been uh, uh, in touch with uh, the, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, the uh, Minister of uh, International uh, Trade and Industry, um, and uh, with the uh, Minister of Justice. Uh, we've had conversations uh, with, uh, with officials uh, uh, within their agencies, um, and we'll continue to do that. Uh, like Michael, I'm not really at liberty to, to share the contents, uh, but I think you can uh, tell from uh, some, some of our comments uh, the nature of uh, the responses we've received uh, so far. Um, we intend to, to continue to have a dialogue with the Japanese government. Uh, my sense is they do uh, want to try to find some way to work with us, uh, but uh, nevertheless, so far, they haven't seen their way clear to, uh, to following uh, some of the recommendations that we made. Okay, I have a question from um, <clears throat> our member, Washington Post uh, correspondent, Simon Dinger. Um, do you think uh, this will cause, uh, this situation, will cause long-term damage to Japan's image as a global regional hub for investors and business? Will it uh, put people off from investing in Japan, even when the virus has gone because foreigners feel unfairly treated. Maybe Christopher, you can start? Certainly. Um, without question, this is an element that businesses are going to have to take under consideration as they're looking for uh, where they're going to be investing uh, or uh, increasing uh, personnel uh, for their businesses um, in, uh, in certainly, uh, at the very least, the short term. Uh, right now, you wouldn't be thinking about it at all. Um, and I think it comes at a particularly awkward time as Japan is talking about how it can strengthen its appeal uh, as a regional and global financial center. Uh, really, uh, really quite uh, unfortunate timing from that point of view. Uh, longer term, of course, there are a lot of factors that are going to go into a decision about where you locate your regional headquarters. Uh, but uh, again, this is a factor that uh, businesses are, are really going to have to think very seriously about, particularly because the pandemic has demonstrated uh, more clearly uh, that uh, this sort of health crisis is something that all businesses must uh, raise uh, on the priority list uh, for their business continuity plans. Uh, and so if, if uh, you're sitting down to figure out uh, what that plan has to look like, uh, for, for Asia uh, on a global basis, and uh, you take this uh, into consideration for Japan, uh, then you're going to have to seriously look uh, to countries where uh, perhaps uh, the policy uh, with, has been uh, more uh, even-handed uh, with respect to both domestic uh, and, uh, and foreign nationals. I thought you want to Thanks. comment Thanks. on this. I, 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 def I definitely agree with, uh, with uh, Chris's opinion. It will have an, uh, an impact, certainly. And uh, what I can add uh, to what Chris just said is that uh, I have been uh, in touch with a couple of companies and directly with the CEOs telling that uh, they, they, they may rethink their, their policy regarding uh, Japan uh, and uh, some others uh, adding that uh, how the travel ban was handled creates a sort of uh, unpredictability for the for the business and uh, is a, a certain a certain risk to be considered also for the for the future. If I uh, maybe Christopher, I I think uh, uh, you didn't um, uh, <clears throat> answer to the third question of Richard before about uh, what do you think uh, is behind all this? I mean, it's just uh, a policy concerning the health, or is there anything uh, behind the scenes, or some uh, misconception, or some even mistake? Because, you know, we all know that Japanese people sometimes do this, make decisions, they realize they are wrong, but then probably they take time to reverse. Well, it's, it's hard to, uh, to uh, shall we say, mind read from afar here. Uh, as I noted, the, there doesn't appear to be a, a rational scientific basis uh, for maintaining this policy. Now, uh, understanding that the Japanese government feels its testing ability is limited, 
uh, you know, clearly that's uh, an element as they think about the numbers they have to deal with. Uh, it's not surprising, perhaps, that they might put uh, Japanese nationals uh, ahead of foreign nationals uh, in, the, in the priority on that. Uh, but again, uh, ultimately, I think that comes back to, uh, to hurt Japan. Uh, and that's why a more equitable policy, uh, we think, would be in Japan's interest as well as uh, in the interest of, uh, of the foreign community here in Japan. Uh, beyond that, I think, uh, you know, there are, one can easily imagine uh, Japanese officials being concerned about their ability to understand clearly uh, where foreigners have been when they return to Japan, uh, whether they've been to difficult areas, um, you know, yeah. et cetera, uh, the follow-up in terms of quarantine, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We've all read about cases where, uh, in some other countries, where uh, quarantine uh, regulations haven't been followed uh, uh, faithfully uh, by travelers, including here in Japan. Uh, so uh, I think that concern is, is understandable, and, and yet uh, certainly it is a, a concern that should be manageable. Uh, and given the stakes that Japan has in maintaining uh, a strong uh, business connection uh, with their global economic partners, uh, we think it's in Japan's interest to resolve this problem quickly. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Etienne Balmer. I'm a journalist of the French Press Agency. Um, I had also uh, two or, or three questions, two and a half, if I may. Um, do you have any idea of the financial, the amount of the financial losses so far from your members, uh, or at least uh, unrealized gains linked to this uh, travel ban? And uh, secondly, uh, did your organization, both of your organization or, or members of your organization, consider to raise this case uh, to the Japanese justice, like as a legal claim? Um, or are you still, yeah, I understand that you are still pursuing, you know, uh, trying to, to, to have a dialogue with the Japanese authorities, but what would be the time or, or, or a moment that, you know, you, 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 you would consider seriously this, uh, this uh, to, to raise this case in, in front of justice? Thank you. Should I go ahead? Yes. All right. So, um, yeah, thank you. Uh, regarding the financial losses, providing uh, any numbers is very, is very difficult. It's very difficult uh, probably even to, to estimate uh, the losses at, at this point. So we do not have any numbers. That was also not part of, uh, of, the, of the survey. And as I said, it's probably very difficult for the, for the companies to, to provide uh, clear numbers at this point. Uh, as for uh, legal actions, uh, we EBC, we, we don't have the mandate to, to do that. It might be at the discretion of, of every company that is, that is impacted to, to proceed uh, in court. Um, as I mentioned before, I know that uh, some companies are uh, considering uh, uh, possibly investment uh, disputes. Investment disputes typically would not be brought to the to a Japanese uh, courts, but but rather solved by uh, international arbitration. Uh, and, and this this has been already raised as a as a topic. Yes. Um, Chris, well, one by one. So, okay, Chris. Let, let me just add that um, um, I'm not a lawyer, and I, I wouldn't presume to. Um, evaluate the, the legal uh, potential for a case here, but um, this is really uh, a, a sovereign decision by Japan uh, that is uh, has a basis uh, in its public health policy, and I don't think you're going to be very successful in any country uh, in challenging uh, that sort of sovereign decision um, in, the, in the court of law, uh, whether it's in Japan or elsewhere. Uh, so I don't think that's a very productive avenue to be pursuing. Uh, I think what we need to do is work with the Japanese government uh, to find ways to uh, demonstrate to them that this can be done uh, safely and that it's in Japan's interest uh, to do it this way. And I think if we do that, uh, we will find uh, eventually that we're successful. Uh, with respect to, uh, to losses, uh, the American Chamber of Commerce spans a, a very wide gamut uh, of companies, uh, everywhere from Fortune uh, 500 uh, global enterprises down to, uh, to one-man startups. 
Um, and so we don't have a, a specific figure on losses uh, that we can uh, estimate at this point. Uh, but I think actually, if you would look at the overall loss in the Japanese economy, uh, you could project that percentage uh, pretty much directly on to, uh, to our organization and our membership and uh, probably come pretty close to an accurate figure. All right. Karine really. Nishima, working for uh, French newspaper Libération and the French uh, uh, radio station Radio France. I have two questions. Uh, I know that uh, a lot of uh, foreign embassy are dealing with uh, with a lot of humanitarian, so-called humanitarian cases. Uh, but did, do you have personally or among your members to deal with so-called uh, humanitarian case, cases you see as humanitarian, but that, that uh, in fact has not been allowed to uh, to go abroad and to uh, come back? That's the first question. And the second question, I asked yesterday to the foreign minister uh, if they will uh, give a kind of priority to residents who are uh, stopped abroad now. And uh, the answer um, is uh, that uh, it seems that they don't attempt to, to do that. Uh, they will reopen uh, country by country very progressively and uh, give priority to business. It means that some businessmen who are not resident in Japan can be allowed to come back before some resident now abroad, but who have no business activities in Japan. I mean, for example, a mother who go abroad with uh, uh, the, the kids to uh, uh, help the kids to enter university in Europe, who are, and who are not allowed to come back now. In this case, what would be your reaction? Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Uh, should, should I start again? Of course, yes. As the, as the EBC, we, we do not deal with uh, humanitarian uh, cases, so we do not uh, uh, approach directly the, the, the ministries uh, and uh, ask them to or support any sort of applications for, for re-entrance uh, to Japan. As uh, the EBC is, is a chamber of the European National Chambers of Commerce, so we mainly support the, the businesses on the lobbying side. So this, uh, to the first question, uh, and no. Although I'm aware uh, myself of, of a couple of cases, uh, definitely. As for um, giving priority to businesses stated by the uh, foreign minister, um, that's probably going a, a little bit into the same direction as the, as the first question. We, uh, of course, personally, I think um, we should, well, allow me to start uh, uh, differently. I think, uh, as I said the last time at the press conference here, uh, we as a, as a European business, we would appreciate, we would uh, uh, we'll be in favor of a three-step approach. So at the first, at first, Japan should reopen for uh, long-term or permanent residents, uh, residents here in Japan, giving them the same rights, as I mentioned before, as uh, Japanese uh, nationals. There is no reason, as, as we heard, uh, so far that we are aware of to treat uh, permanent residents or long-term residents uh, differently. Uh, in the second step, we would like to see uh, reopening towards uh, business. And uh, we think that, of course, the wave can be large. And uh, we know that uh, Japan has contained the spread of the virus uh, in a very good way. I fully agree with, uh, with Chris's words. Uh, at the very beginning. Uh, we have high respect for what the Japanese government has done. Uh, we see regarding the second step that it might be uh, a good solution to have uh, numbers per day of, of uh, people that uh, Japan may want to let into the country uh, to have some restrictions to look at cases uh, on the case by case basis. Uh, opening borders and without any control of uh, the numbers of uh, foreigners coming in uh, may actually uh, be against uh, uh, this, or actually may, may, may destroy this uh, beautiful numbers that Japan can uh, so far uh, show. So uh, to, uh, to answer your question, I think it would be, it should be actually regardless case by case 
Mata. Um, with respect to the ACCJ, oh, uh, we do, of course, know of, of cases where uh, uh, application has been made uh, for permission to travel on a humanitarian basis, um, and we certainly try to assist our members in uh, connecting with the uh, appropriate officials in the Japanese government to pursue uh, those cases as they arise. Um, uh, sure, like all of you, we've, uh, we're aware of, uh, of cases in which uh, permission has been granted and other cases in which it uh, has been denied. Um, and uh, our, uh, you know, certainly our hope and expectation is that uh, the number of cases and the basis on which uh, judgments are made will, uh, will expand uh, as, uh, as time goes on. And indeed, we've seen, I think, that uh, over the last uh, month or so, uh, the, um, the immigration agency's criteria for consideration of humanitarian exceptions uh, has been uh, uh, specified a little bit more clearly. Um, and uh, our understanding is that uh, they're willing to look uh, at cases that go beyond the uh, immediate uh, letter of, of uh, our specific designations uh, of those humanitarian cases that have been uh, issued in writing. Uh, so there clearly is a willingness to, uh, to consider cases, and I think that's, that's a, a tentative step that the Japanese government has tried to take uh, to be uh, at least uh, somewhat uh, responsive to the concerns that we're raising today. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the, the numbers that are being uh, given permission uh, under that rubric uh, are so small uh, that uh, it really doesn't uh, amount to an adequate response uh, to the concerns that we have about foreign nationals in Japan being unable to travel. So we really need to go to, uh, to uh, an equal basis uh, for consideration uh, for both uh, foreign nationals uh, and uh, Japanese nationals under this policy. Um, beyond that, I don't think I've got uh, anything further. Uh, Michael laid out uh, a step-by-step -step process here. Uh, I think we would uh, largely agree with that. Uh, we appreciate the fact that Japan uh, perhaps has a, uh, a a third step in there um, in terms of its uh, concept of allowing travel to some specific countries where the virus uh, appears to be under control. Uh, you know, it seems to be taking uh, some considerable time to work out uh, the arrangements uh, with those countries. So uh, we've been hearing about this now for quite a few weeks. Uh, and uh, to my knowledge, there have been very few flights uh, under those rubrics. Um, and so, uh, Clearly, it's going to be uh, some time uh, before we're seeing uh, more general business travel begin here. Uh, but as we've both been saying uh, from the beginning here, uh, this is really in Japan's interest from a business point of view uh, and from an economic point of view uh, to, uh, to reopen uh, business travel as soon as uh, the pandemic will allow us. Wanted to another question, Richard? No? I, I saw that. Okay, John. <clears throat> uh, John Anderson, sorry, um, Soka Kakai. Um, I've been in touch before about a particular legal question, but I take it that legal issues are not the way that any of the Chambers of Commerce or the Business Council is wanting to go forward. But I wonder, in view of this perceived kind of concern on the Jap from the Japanese perspective of sort of hundreds and thousands of people all wanting to come in at once and that not being manageable. Is there any um, possibility of offering to kind of jointly handle these issues of testing and quarantine even, you know, for people coming back in and trying to come to, say, different countries having maybe quotas, maybe limits, but sort of offering assistance to deal with that in, I guess the only example that comes to mind for me is, is a sort of Eurostar model between the UK and other countries in Europe where there's a, a joint handling of certain issues. Anyway, I just wondered if it's something that's been looked at at all. Thank you. I, uh, I think, as I mentioned before, uh, what, what we may, what would be one solution is that the testing takes already place at the at the airport where the where the person is uh, departing. 
Uh, also, what we could uh, imagine is to have uh, to have basically flights, uh, ch chartered flights, where, where uh, the whole group is uh, uh, screened before getting on the flight uh, to make sure that uh, who is arriving here to Japan uh, is is really uh, negative in the sense of uh, of the PCR uh, testing. Um, more, more than that, uh, doesn't that's not come uh, into my mind. Yeah. Christopher, you want to? Yeah, I would just add that I think we need to be careful about creating um, a, a superstructure around this problem uh, that uh, is going to be uh, tremendously uh, costly um, and uh, probably impose even more bureaucratic uh, impediments uh, to business travel going forward. Uh, rather than, than you know, I, I, I would imagine that there are governments that are prepared to work with Japan uh, on uh, on some sort of uh, of uh, mutual effort here to uh, uh, verify uh, testing and that sort of thing. Uh, but you know, you, you have to keep bear in mind that the nature of testing uh, in this circumstance is such that uh, probably the governments aren't not necessarily uh, best placed. Certainly from the at the point of departure. Uh, to be managing that. Uh, you know, perhaps uh, the uh, travel industry will be developing solutions along those lines. We've seen reports, of course, in the media uh, that some are considering what can be done in the way of testing in advance of folks getting on flights. Uh, you can imagine that would be uh, uh, perhaps part of the kind of solution you're talking about. Uh, and then on the receiving end, uh, it's going to be under, up to each receiving country fundamentally uh, to uh, to uh, test as it's it each as each uh, country sees fit, um, and uh, you know trying to create some bilateral or, or supranational superstructure around that I think is going to be very challenging and and potentially uh, more uh, create more problems than it solves. Uh, what we should be hoping to see is that each country uh, develops at its ports of entry uh, a robust testing system. Uh, that ensures that uh, folks who are, are entering uh, their territories uh, are, are tested uh, and if, uh, if, assuming they are free of the virus, allowed to uh, conduct uh, their business uh, uh, within the country uh, and if it turns out that they, they are infected, that uh, they be quarantined for as long as necessary. Um, and if we can establish those systems in each country, we're probably going to be better off. Thank you. <clears throat> well, we are approaching the end. Uh, Michael, let me ask you the last question. <clears throat> I was touched a little bit when uh, you articulated your, your emotion humanly before, saying, I consider this my own country too. I have my kids asking uh, what happens to me, what happens here. When you heard yesterday um, Foreign Minister Motegi speaking uh, of uh, Gaijin, foreigners, again, in such a way that like we are potentially the danger, we are different, we are uncontrollable, and so on. As a long resident, I guess you are a permanent resident, right? Well, anyway, you, are, you have a, a Japanese wife, you have a family here. You consider your country uh, this place uh, along with your original one. Emotionally, what could you tell us? How do you feel? I mean, is it? Uh... Yeah, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm beyond disappointed. You know, I, I think in general, uh, you know, I think this is uh, the the fact of uh, of tying uh, tying the travel ban to nationality. It's a it's a systemic mistake. It's a systemic mistake. I think. Uh, you know, pe people people are born. I mean, like I said before, they are Japanese born abroad, and they are Japanese, so they can travel. They are foreigners born in Japan. They cannot. Beyond disappointment. Thank you very much. Thank you both. Uh, um, uh, Michael, you are already a honorary member, so I guess you will get just uh, some souvenir. And uh, for Christopher, we have an honorary membership uh, to this club for one year that you can pick up at your uh, pleasure whenever you show up here. Okay? Thank, Thank you. you. It's an honor.
thank you very much uh, to both, and uh, let's hope to meet uh, possibly again to celebrate the end of the battle. Thank you, Vio, very much. <laughs>